Hey, I'm Cameron McKenzie, and I want to show you the top 10 most common compile time errors that developers in Java run into. Now, I don't know if this is the most common compile error, but it's certainly the most common one that new developers make, and it's the fact that the name of the class file has to match exactly the name of the file as it exists on the file system. I'm going to open this up in my Windows Explorer, and you'll see that the file name here is compile error 00.java, but somebody's thought it'd be a good idea to remove the 00 there and make that a lowercase letter. Well, that's not going to work. It has to match exactly. I see a lot of problems with this, especially when people use the command window, terminal window, DOS window to write and compile code as they're learning. So that name and the name on the file system have to match exactly. Once they do, control S, save, the error goes away. Okay, what is another common error that we see when we're developing Java code? Well, a very common compile time error is the fact that, well, your Java code is case sensitive. So there's an uppercase I on the int there. No, that's supposed to be lowercase. There's a lowercase s. No, that has to be uppercase. I actually didn't know that Java had to be case sensitive, that Java was case sensitive when I first started programming. And I actually gave up on it. I gave up on it for a long time because I didn't know it was case sensitive and I had nobody there to guide me. So this can be very, very frustrating to new developers, especially JavaScript developers, where you're working with a language that's not case sensitive. But Java is. This expresses a lot of meaning about your code, how things are cased, camel case, dromedary case, snake case. Um, so just be careful. Casing is important in Java. The third most common type of compile error that I see is missing brackets. And you can see right here, well, there should be a round bracket there to match this round bracket there. You always need to have matching brackets. Every time you open a bracket, you have to have a matching close bracket. The problem with this error is that the error messages aren't always great. So look, system out cannot be resolved. It's like system out can't be resolved. Like that's a fundamental class. Then the last one there, duplicate local variable X, that's not helpful at all, right? Those aren't the errors. The error is just the fact that I don't have that round brace there and those errors go away. But with missed brackets, sometimes you get really weird errors that are difficult to troubleshoot. Furthermore, sometimes you get error messages in a weird spot. So here the error message says, hey, add a, a bracket to complete the class body on line 12, but you know the bracket should be added up on line 10. So even just where the errors go can throw you off a little bit. That can be frustrating for a new developer. So sometimes if you just right click and you say source format code, that can help you identify errors. Online linting tools are good as well. But yeah, be careful, always match your braces. Here's another common error. Uh, the rule that I always say about Java is that every line of code in Java ends with a semicolon, except for the lines of code that don't end with a semicolon. And that's sort of a tautological statement, but those three statements there did not have semicolons on them, and that's why we had the compile error but if you add those semicolons in, those errors go away. Now I always joke that every line of code is a semicolon except the lines of code that don't have semicolons because that doesn't have a semicolon and that doesn't have a semicolon and for loops don't have semicolons and while loops don't have semicolons. It's because these are statements, right? These are actual statements to execute and these are class code structure comments and even while loops for loops their flow control so those elements don't have semicolons in them because they don't terminate a statement uh, they're more structure but statements like that always have to have a semicolon the fifth error here let's take a look at this code oh this code looks all good to me what's the error well left hand side assignment variable oh boy all sorts of weird errors here um the error is actually somebody's put round brackets after a variable. I see that quite often. People that aren't familiar of where to put the brackets, right? You only put these round brackets when you're calling a method or defining a method. Sometimes people put them next to a variable and that can generate a whole bunch of really weird errors. Um, that one gets fixed just by getting rid of those semicolons. Um, also down here, you'll see this method. The method X is undefined for the type compile error for like right over here. Um, this here, somebody's actually calling a method just with the wrong name in this case. So this here can sometimes trigger this error, which is the method undefined. But down here, 
um, you're definitely got a method undefined because they're calling the method x and it should be x spelled eks. So sometimes it's literally just a method being called incorrectly. Other times it's just a piece of code like that where somebody's actually put the round brackets on a variable. Okay, that code is fixed. Let's go over here to compile error number five. This one is a duplicate variable declaration. You can't do that. Once a variable has been declared and typed, you can't declare and type it again, even when I say type it, that, that's like give it a data type, even if it's the same data type, right? So int x equals 10 equal int x equals 20. It's like, no, 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 you already declared it as an x. Just leave it alone right there, x equals 20. So declaring variables a second time is a very common compile error. The duplicate local variable compile error comes a lot up a lot. So if you do that, just find out where you originally declared that variable and keep track of it and don't redeclare that variable in your code. And if you do want to redeclare the variable, we'll just give it a different variable name and that will work as well. Okay, compile error seven. Oh, look at this one. We've got a class variable and a local variable here, and we're trying to print out the local variable. That all looks good to me. What's the error? Boom, the local variable may not have been initialized. Well, anytime you have a local variable, if you ever want to use it in your code, you have to initialize it. So it's an int. I can actually just assign it to zero, and the code goes away, right? So you just have to initialize it. Here it's saying the local variable may not have been initialized, and just giving it a default value fixes it. Now you might be saying, well, I thought all primitive types got initialized to zero or the equivalent of zero. And I thought all class variables got initialized to null. Why is it doing that? Well, it's because this is a local variable. If you actually have a class variable, those are initialized to zero. So if I change this from local variable to class variable, notice I don't have the error, right? It, the error actually just goes away. So, well, here it says you can't make a static reference to that, so I'll make that variable static. There we go. Problem goes away. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Class variables, instance variables, and class variables, static variables, those are initialized by default, even if you don't give them a value, they're initialized to zero. Uh, local variables are not. So be careful with that one. That's a tricky little rule in Java. Over here, we've got a variable declared, int x equals 10, and then string square equals x times x. That should be the square of x. But of course, this is a string, so I'm getting an error message here that says type mismatch, cannot convert from int to string. And that's because, yeah, this is an int. Multiply an int by an int, and you get an int. And we're trying to hold it as a string. So there's an easy way to fix this. You just make your square the data type that gets returned from multiplying two ints, which is an int. And now everything goes swimmingly. Um, there's actually even a, another little trick. If you did want this as a string, you could actually go plus x times x. And that would actually cause the int to get concatenated, added to a string. And that would work as well. But that's a, a little trick uh, if you want to take those ints and very quickly convert them into a string. But really, this is the key here. If you've got a variable, um, you can't change the variable type dynamically. And if you've got a string, well, you can't store an int in a string. You'll end up getting that compile error. Now over here, point of no return. It looks like we've got a method that returns a string and then we've got a string right here. A, B, C, D, E, F, U, and your, anyways, um, right there. The method must return a result of string. Well, there's a string, there's a string, but aha, there's no return statement, right? So this says this method is going to return a string. Well, we declared a string, but we didn't explicitly return it. So if your method says that it's going to return an instance of a certain type, you better have a return statement in it that actually returns an instance of that type. Uh, alternatively, if you don't want to do that, make it void. So actually, let me just see what that error message was before I did that. The method must return a result of type string, yep. So optionally, if you don't want to return anything, you just make it void, and then the error goes away as well. Of course, we get a little warning there, because it's going to say, when you declared a variable and you didn't do anything with it, but I don't know, I feel that's kind of judgy, and uh, I don't feel like I need to be judged today. 
Okay, and then finally, number 10. Hey, this only goes up to number nine. I thought I had 10 here. Oh, my counting must be off. Anyways, uh, here's a little bit of logic. Okay, all looks good. We've got a variable, do something if it's less than 10, otherwise do something else. And then when we're done, print out done. And it says unreachable code. Well, of course that code's unreachable, right? So we said if X is less than 10, return true, otherwise return false. Well, there's no other condition, right? Either it does this, and if it doesn't do that, it does this. Either way, you know, we've returned, we've exited the method. So this will never get encountered. So yeah, we end up getting this message here, unreachable code, yeah, because that code will never run. So um, move it before the return statements. Um, now that's actually gonna get executed. So click Control S and that error goes away. And there you go. Those are the 10 most common compile errors that new developers, and let's face it, even experienced developers often run into. And there you go. Those are the top 10 compile time errors that Java programmers run into. If you enjoyed that tutorial, head over to the serverside.com. We got lots of great tutorials on Java, DevOps, and enterprise programming in general. And please subscribe on YouTube.